I've done all that. I've been on Hard Knocks. I've, you know, been on those those shows inside the NFL or whatever it was on HBO. And, you know, you get your 15 minutes of fame and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, it's about relationships. Yeah. And it's about helping others. Welcome, Steve Mushagan, to the Young Athletic. Thanks for coming on. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. We just got done with our first practice, and uh, yeah, this is this is nice. Tell us how day one went. Day one went good. You know, a lot of new faces. In you know, it's it's always uh, hard the first three days because you're putting the pads on for the first time, mm-hmm. and guys are trying to do things the right way, but. Uh, We'll have our first scrimmage on Saturday, so we'll wow. kind of see how they are. I mean, I was optimistic, but I'm always guardedly optimistic like yeah. every every coach is early on. So who are you going to scrimmage against? It's that? just going to be an inner squad this, this week, and then the following week we go to Long Beach City College nice. and get to scrimmage them. Are they in your conference? They're not. They used to be, but not anymore. Yeah. How many uh, players do you have? Right now, we hit 115 today. Wow. Are they all returners? Are they all a bunch of them I would new? say there are uh, 40 to 45 returners, and then you've got a few transfers, and then uh, the rest of them are new high school players. It's like a small army. <laughs> Some days it feels like that. How do you get to know everybody on that? On a team like that. You know, I work really hard. That's why I control, like, the jersey numbers and things like that so I can put faces with numbers, and it helps me learn. Uh, You just got to kind of walk around and go by each one of your position coaches that you have for each unit and spend a little time there and watch those drills, and you kind of get used to the number and the name that goes with the number. Mm -hmm. But for doing it for 42 years, I've kind of perfected it somewhat. Your process. It, it's it's definitely the process, no yeah. doubt about it. What's it like having like all those different coaches? Because on a soccer team, we just have one or two coaches, and you've got you know. Well, we've got one staff. for every position, so yeah. we've got about fifteen coaches. So you've got to you've got to manage them and coach coaches. But we've been very lucky to be able to hire people that have either played there or understand where we're coming from and what we want to accomplish and I've got one of the best coaching staffs I believe you know this year it's a re- it's a very cohesive unit they work well with each other uh, they like to joke around and have a good time but they're all all very serious about getting the job done so kind of a blessing this this group is yeah are they um like also VC faculty or are they just sort of well we have uh we have uh, two full-time faculty members, and then myself, so that's three. And then we have six part-time VC faculty members, and then we have some what we call professional experts hmm. that are more stipend, uh, that have other jobs. And then we also have uh, three or four volunteer coaches that get out there and help us too. So it's a uh, and it's a good mix of ages, probably from you know the the mid '60s all the way to guys in their 20s. So it's a good, uh, yeah. and it, it's really fun to blend them all together. Yeah, it's, it'd be fun to come together. You know, being a part of a team is so special. It really is. It's it's, uh, you know, they always ask me, uh, what about all these kids have changed? And I said the kids haven't really changed. The information that we give them has changed, mm. which causes them to maybe make some choices that we would, wouldn't have made, you know, yeah. 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Pressure, more pressure on them, too, hmm. with social media. And, you know, and they, they're always worried about what's next instead hmm. of enjoying the moment and playing in the moment because it goes by fast. Yeah. It goes by really fast. It's two years. Yeah, two years. But, I mean, you're going to play – Four years of football, if you play four years of college football, you're lucky. I mean, you're extremely lucky if you get to play 50 games. And there's yeah. some sports, that's a season. We're yeah. talking about four seasons to yeah, get 50 yeah. games in. Yeah. Yeah, it's the the rarity. It's like the urgency. It creates urgency. It does. And there's more. Um, it's the probably the, the one sport where you practice more than you play games. Mm. 
without a doubt. You spend way more time practicing than playing games. That's so interesting because, like, as soccer coaches, we always say the kids develop the most when they are in games. You know, the, the practices, you don't really get to see their instincts or their habits kick in in a practice. You see it in a game a lot more. I, there's no doubt about that. It's just... You know, when you go and you play a game, which what I loved about soccer and baseball and basketball, you'd play a game on Tuesday. If you lost, you could get back on Thursday or Friday yeah. and play another one. For us, we got to go a whole week uh, before we play again. And a lot of times, you know, you got to try to fix and correct the errors. And we, you know, you watch a lot of tape. You watch a lot mm. of your everything's filmed nowadays. You yeah. see everything's, you know, on camera. So. You see all these different angles and all these different analytics about things, and uh, it still comes down to the basics. You know, can you block? Can you tackle? Can you catch? Can you run? Yeah. Same thing in soccer. Yeah. What do you uh, project for this season, the success? Well, we were talking about that. We've set the bar high because we've, you know, what been conference champions, I think, 10 out of the last 11 years. So. Wow. That's kind of a minimum standard for us, and we were one game away from the state title game. We lost in the Southern California Championship game to Riverside, who went on and won the state title. So we've, uh, you know, we've been knocking at the door. We just need to get back. In 2018, we won the Southern California title and then lost the state championship game. So we're eager to keep working and, and our goal always is to try to get back to the state championship game and then to win it. But, you know, our whole our whole motto or, or mission statement or kind of who we are is one day, one uh, one day, one play, one game at a time. Yeah, yeah. And if you think too far in the future, you're gonna lose some things right in front of you. What uh is there a game beyond that final game? Is there like a bowl game for So you get ten regular you get a scrimmage that you don't keep score on, although everybody does. Yeah. Uh, you know how those things go. You have 10 regular season games, and then if you win a certain amount of games, uh, you can go into a bowl game, which would be your 11th game. If you win the, your conference championship, then you get to go into the playoffs. And if you go into the playoffs, there's only four teams. So there's three conference champions and a wild card. So mm -hmm. it's, it's the hardest... Uh, of any of the community college sports, it's the hardest one to get in the playoffs. Mm. And, you know, it's all about winning your conference, and we've, we've found a way to do that. But we, uh, we've won it a couple times, and we're co-champions and, you know, lost the tiebreaker. But we've been in the playoffs, I think, uh, eight or nine times in the last ten years. So that's kind of – when we're not in the playoffs, it's kind of a disappointment. This is a – kind of off topic have you seen the um the show on netflix uh last chance you yes the one about yes i have uh, we were actually uh laney college the team that beat us in the uh state championship game when they start that they show the last play of the game against us and talk about oh you're game. in it so we're in it a little bit that's uh, cool we were, we were uh, not indirectly, but kind of a roundabout way, were asked if we'd be interested in doing it. And, oh, you should. And I think it, it – but then Laney, Laney got asked to do it, and then oh, they I made see. the uh, decision to go with basketball, and I think they went to East L.A. Uh, to do their basketball program. But they started out in you know, East Mississippi, and then I think they went to Independence, Kansas, and then worked their way out to yeah. the California. But the, the Kansas one with uh, that coach is pretty... JB's a, a good old <laughs> friend of mine. Yeah? And uh, we've... Uh, You've known him for a while? I've known him for a while. He's That's awesome. Uh, he's a, a little rough around the edges, but he speaks his mind and his heart. I kind of like him. He's giant. He's, he's really – he wants the best for those kids. I mean, we have different – we have different styles. I was probably – when I was his age, I might have been a little bit more like him. Mm -hmm. I probably had a little bit better language. Uh, and I've tried really hard to clean that part up to be uh, – you know, to really watch what you say. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes I – you know, coaches forget that uh, we have to – practice what we preach too and so yeah but jb needed to do that with those kids to get them to understand to wake them up yeah to wake them up because they were all 
there was no way to bring them together as a team because they were all about themselves, and he had to make a cohesive unit yeah. in a short period of time. Yeah. You know, when you think about it, you take 100-plus guys, and you got three months a three-month season, and you're going to try to get them. You know, you get a, four weeks in the summer when you get them together, and then you – you got two weeks, and then you're scrimmaging, and another week, and you're playing a game. And so you have to find a way to develop chemistry. And a lot of times, if you have a good culture established, which he didn't going in, where we have our returning players kind of help mm-hmm. with that. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like Hoffie with, with soccer. He's had so many great years that they kind of, the expectations, when you come in, you kind of know what to expect, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. a good thing. Yeah. I saw also a video with uh, Jared Goff. Yes. I, I'd i seen the video before, and then I saw it more recently. I was like, oh, that's VC. It was. That, <laughs> that was probably – now, I got an email from Red Bull, and they were asking about because they had done it with, uh, with a baseball player at Mesa College in Arizona. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was like some fake, so I sent it to my son, Bobby, and I said, Bobby, you handle this. And he calls me back, goes, we're doing it. Dad, let me handle it. And I'm just thinking, okay, right. And we sat down to the production meeting. We went through everything. And he knew it. I knew it. Nobody else knew it. We had um, – and we actually – they actually came out and interviewed our kids for three days. And they'd have these stickers that said CTD, which was Chasing the Dream. So they thought they were doing a documentary on that. So they had no idea. Hmm. And then during that, uh, I announced that we had a transfer quarterback that uh, was interested in coming to VC, and sure enough, that was that was Jared. And, and uh, that's awesome. So it was pretty cool. I finally got the pictures we had taken. Uh, a good friend of mine is the passing game coordinator for the Detroit Lions, so I I finally got the pictures developed uh, that we had with Jared, and then the team one that we took or the group yeah. one we took, and sent them out to him. So. Maybe I'll get them back at some point, but uh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to have to put those up in the office. But that was a lot of fun. I think, to be honest, that's probably gotten almost a billion views. I mean, it's 80 million views or something crazy like that. Yeah. I was going to tell the college, I said, there's no uh, way they could have gotten as much free advertising as that. Well, it's it doesn't save into a college very clearly because I had seen it before and it, it didn't cross my mind that it was so close to home. It, it's it's hard to say because uh, they made it as the transfer. Yeah. It was the title on it. And he pranks, a, a, they said he uh, how Jared Goff pranks a junior college football yeah. team. was. But you, you can look at it and you can see we had to blank out some of the stuff. I don't think mm. any of the jerseys we wore had Ventura on it. You could tell Maybe it was orange why. and black and you could tell it was in the stadium. Uh, I could the, see like this, like the geography. Right. I recognize the geography because I've been there so many times lately. I was like, "Oh, is that Ventura College?" And then I saw the VC on the on the field. Yeah, that kind of gave it away. It's funny because they've uh, they just had the uh, they had the Bachelorette play a flag football game there a few years back, really? and I think they just had the golden bachelor was there this summer mm. so when you watch that and the next one you'll see a, a game <laughs> at vc so there'll be another one but always fun to uh to have that side of it it's, um, yeah i mean it's we're right next to hollywood so i'm sure they're always looking for i live in fillmore and uh they're always shooting in Fillmore. yes I'm amazed at how many movies were filmed in Ventura County. You can kind of Google that, and, yeah. and they'll tell you. But there's a lot of them. I recognize uh, my wife likes to watch, like, Up TV and Hallmark, and every now and then you'll see downtown Santa Paula or downtown Fillmore or mm-hmm. Moore Park uh, always in, in those in those shows. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, fun to, it's fun to see your hometown or see your, your area. Ventura County get some publicity. Yeah. It's a special place. It you is. Know? Very much so. Very that's, special. That's part of what I want to talk about. Is what brought you to Ventura and what do you think is special about it? What do you love about it? The funniest thing is I'd bounced all over the country and I'd coached in the NFL at, at Cincinnati. And, and, you know, when I was in Pittsburgh, I was in Nevada, I was at Fresno State. And so I've lived in a lot of different places and seen a lot of different things. And I came back out to Sacramento and then I ended up in San Diego. And 
one day I, uh, I saw a few of these junior college, community college jobs come open, and I said, I'm going to find me one of these jobs between uh, San Diego and Santa Barbara near the beach, and I'm going to stay put. So I remember I never thought the Ventura job was going to come open. I always thought the Moorpark job was going to come over before uh, Ventura because of the age of the head coach at the time. Mm. So Ventura came open, and I interviewed. And I remember driving up the interview, and I went up Victoria, uh, and somehow or another I turned on Foothill, and I saw a park, and I turned in the park, and I think I had a burger or something I was eating, and I had no clue. And I pulled out a uh, Arroyo Verde Park. Yeah, yeah. I made a right turn on Foothill, and I saw the ocean, and it was so clear. I said I could see people walking on the Channel Islands, and I said, I want this job, and if I get this job, I'm never leaving. Wow. And I remember that feeling, and uh, it really helped me on the interview because I had so much enthusiasm because I wanted to be here so bad. And I had knew about, um, you know, Westlake and Thousand Oaks and, and a little bit in Ventura and Camarillo. And uh, my dad always told me the best weather and the best weather in the United States is in Santa Paula hmm. when I was a kid. And I'd go, where, where the heck Santa Paula, <laughs> you know, where's Santa Paula? But, uh, you know, it, it was kind of a destined thing. My dad was a high school football coach, and his very first playoff game, he played uh, Santa Clara High School in Oxnard. Yeah. And I've got the old 16-millimeter film of that game. Wow. And the coaches all wore white shirts with ties, and every player sat on the bench in unison. And it's like going back and watching a movie from the, you know, a throwback movie from the 60s. But yeah. uh, it's just Ventura County's just been a really, uh, really a blessing. My wife uh, loves it. Um, she lived in Camarillo for a while and just really, she's lived all over. She's from Nebraska and came to Camarillo and just, and been in Orange County like I've been all over. I grew up in Downey near Long Beach. But it always seemed like, you know, going over the, uh, going down the grade, it was like, oh, and this is a long way, hmm. you know, but... Uh, I think it's it's got great weather, yeah. it's got great people, and we don't have all that crazy traffic like you do in Orange yeah. County and L.A. County. It's a good secret. Let's don't let's don't tell too many yeah. people. Well, we'll end the interview right now. Yeah, that's right. We're talking about <laughs> it. No, I love it too. I grew up in Camarillo, and I moved to the Midwest for high school and college, and I loved it. Uh, and then I went further east to New England, and I didn't like that. But coming back, it's like. You know, it feels like home. So you've done the same, pretty much the same thing I did. And, yeah. and uh, you really, I always say people take California for granted. And I know we've got our problems. And, and It's pricey. You know, and, and all there's there's positives and negatives. But every person that I talk to, the, the one thing they say, the one thing I miss most about California is the weather. Mm -hmm. They always say the weather. Mm -hmm. And then it's the beach, of course. And, and uh People don't realize, and you grew up in Camarillo, how close Malibu is and how easy it is to get there. Uh, yeah. Just going out Lewis Road all the way or whatever it is. And, yeah. And I just think, like, I take for granted waking up every morning to sunshine. You know, it's just, it's always sunny. It's always blue. It really is special. Um, I kind of knew that when I came back from... Uh, because I spent some time in the Central Valley in Sacramento. In those days, yeah, the sun's out, but it's 95 that's, degrees at that's too much. You know, yeah. 6 a.m. And <laughs> it, was, it was a different... Fresno's. Yeah, Fresno's it was dry. Animal. It was dry. And when I went back to San Diego, I, I really appreciated the water and, and the, you know, the 70 degrees every day weather. And then the same way it was when we moved back up to... Ventura County, it's just, it's beautiful. Yeah, you get a little fog in Ventura every now and then, but uh, yeah. that's why I always say when I drive from Camarillo to Ventura, I always have a hoodie because hmm. you never know the, yeah. how the weather will change. Yeah, yeah. Just, but I think our, ki our kids come from all over the country, uh, and they always tell me all the time, like, Coach, this is the best weather I've ever played in. I go, how hot would it be in Georgia today? They go, Coach, you don't want to know. <laughs> Or I'll joke with them. I say, "How hot is it in Moore Park?" And they'll laugh. I go, "Yeah, know, even Moore Park. Fillmore's hot too." But. Yeah, Fillmore. Our our uh, assistant head coach Terry Morris lives in Fillmore, mm. so he we, we always joke. And I'm in Camarillo, so we're driving in. We you know you can see a little fog 
every now and then go, yeah, it's, we go from 90 to 80 to 70 real quick. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting. But we've got – our coaches are kind of spread out all over. We've got four or five in Camarillo. We've got one in Fillmore. We've got one in Santa Paula, a couple in Oxnard, a couple in Ventura. So it's uh, – but everybody's pretty much on this side of the hill and uh, – or this side of the grade and yeah, down the really, grade. really enjoying – they love coaching here. They love being a part of it because, you know, it's just – you look to the right of you and you see the foothills and look to the left and you see the ocean. You don't get many, you know, picture X yeah. places like that. Yeah. I used to take the Hawaii kids when they got homesick. I'd take them up to the top of the bleachers and said, that's Molokai and Maui. I go, mm. those are the Hawaiian islands out there, the Channel Islands. That's but, funny. Uh, it's a funny story. What's, um, what's recruiting like for uh, junior college? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's challenging because... It's open. You don't get them locked into you until you start. Like today, locked all our players in, so they're locked in here for a for a year, year or for the season. They can't, you know, leave next week and try to go somewhere else and be eligible. Yeah. So everybody's got to recruit all the way to the very end. And you do have some surprises. You have some kids. We had one kid we thought was coming, and then, you know, went to a. A scholarship junior college in Kansas, as we were talking about. And, you know, you just never know. And they all are very, they get excited about it. But, and then some of them decide they don't want to play, you know, they, or there's problems and they've got to get a job. So you've got to keep a big list and you've got to stay fluid with it. You can't, it's not like when you're at Division One and you get 25 guys sign their scholarship and you know they're locked in. I mean, you better recruit. If you want 25, you better recruit 50 to get 25. Yeah, yeah. So you've got to be able to uh, – you're going to get some rejection and you have to have thick skin and you can't take anything personal. Yeah. And we try to never knock you know, our opponents. We try to sell what we're about because mm-hmm. I think we've got – enough to sell that we don't have to because I always felt like if you if you knock your opponents you know that doesn't why don't you sell your positives instead of you know sell their negatives yeah and so I I think that's really the hardest part is just the time and not the unknown you could have a kid that was here all spring and all summer and then Yesterday, let's say he decided he wanted to go somewhere else and showed up at their meeting today or wow. their practice, and he'd be locked into that school. So that's, that's tough. And that's at any sport at the community college level. Yeah. So it's just the rules. Do you uh, like recruit nationally? Or is it we do. Local? Most of the out of state uh, is be- is word of mouth. We can make first contact anywhere in the state, anywhere out of state. Now with the problem is we get. Uh, Twitter, I call them Twitter recruits or X recruits because there's so much going on on that platform that they'll send you their film. And, you know, they all, there's a lot of kids that like to get recruited Mm -hmm. and like the attention. But do they really love the game? Do they really want to play? Yeah. I think there's some that would rather be recruited than actually play the game. Yeah. So you've got to filter through some of that and, you know, find the kids that fit your culture. And that's why I think our coaches have a really good idea of what kids fit your culture. But you'll make, some, you'll make mistakes, you know, and there, there's going to be kids that come out. Uh, you have two kids you really like, and then a, a third and a fourth one want to come too, but they just want to move to, I always say they're rent payers, and they want to move to California for their California vacation. Yeah. I and they're mean, not really committed to playing. I don't blame them for that. Right. <laughs> you know, it's understandable. Yeah. So we'll get some of that. you got to filter through it. But uh, I think we do a, a great job in, in really helping uh, our enrollment is the football program's enrollment is higher than any class on, on campus. And I think we've sent uh, almost 400 kids out in the last – you know, 15 years to to four-year universities. And so our transfer rate is as high as anyone in the state uh, of moving kids out to the next level. And we promote that and sell that and work really hard at uh, getting our kids, you know, out there. With that new NCAA transfer portal, it's making it a little tougher because they're going to bounce around. These kids can go from one college to another 
and be immediately eligible. Yeah, At yeah. our level, they can't. They have oh, to really? put in residency at the next school. So if I'm at Moore Park and I want to come play at Ventura, I've got to come in the spring, and then I've got to pass 12 units in residency at Ventura before I'm eligible in the fall, between wow. the spring and the summer. And that's for that's across the board at any sport. So why is it harder for junior college and Division One now? Oh, because everything filters down. Yeah. Everything filters down, and there's more money involved, and you've got the NIL with the name, image, and likeness. So mm-hmm. these guys are getting, uh, you know, they're, they're getting their money before they even they sign the dotted line. They're still in high school, and they're coming to, you know, driving their Corvette or their Porsche or their Lamborghini to practice. On uh, there's some schools that everybody that that's uh, in their program gets a Dodge Ram truck. I mean, it is. Sign it's something. Sign so the up. almighty dollar has yeah. changed it all. Yeah. That in, in social media along with uh, the, what you, what the chosen things that you see on TV. You don't even know. And now we got AI. So we don't even know. We may see a guy <laughs> making a great catch and it's not even him. Yeah, that's <laughs> funny. AI. Yeah, so it's, it's a whole new game. And you have to, as a coach, you have to adapt to, to the kids. You have to adapt to the changes. It's not really the kids. As I said, the kids are still, you know, kids at heart, but they have so many other things telling them what to do. And yeah. you could do this, you could do that. And the money that's out there, they want to go from, they want to go from high school to the NFL. You know, they don't realize they got to pay their dues in, in between. It's, it's yeah. a, it's a crazy world we live in now. Yeah, that gets r- get rich quick. Yes, yeah, it's it's a, uh, you know, it affects adults and kids now. It does, it does. It's even with the coaches. You know, they want to. Uh, I'll get. Co- I hired a couple coaches the last couple of years, and they, you know, did a great job for me. And then they want to move on to that next level because they want to. They want to move up to the Division One lifestyle, and then the Division One paychecks. Mm. And the thing they lose is job security. Mm. Because those jobs, uh, I was in the NFL, and they said NFL stands for not for long. Yeah, yeah. And uh, luckily, I was there long enough to to be a vested retirement. But uh, it is uh, it's hard to stay at one place for a long time. Do you in mind football? Do you mind talking about your time in the NFL? The uh, no, not at all. I enjoyed it. Um, the crazy part of it was uh, I ended up drafting two wide receivers, Chad Johnson and T.J. Hushmanzada, who were both California Community College pro, uh, prospects. They both they played at Santa Monica and Cerritos. And so it was really funny because I, bo- I knew their coaches mm-hmm. um, and knew a lot about them before we drafted them, which, which was a lot of fun. But really in the, in the NFL, to make it simple, it's the only place where the pupil fail, fails and the teacher will get fired for it. <laughs> because everything, if they spend a lot, of, basically is if I draft a guy and pay him millions of dollars and he doesn't produce, what happens? The coach gets fired and the kid's still there. And now they're able to, with the salary cap and all, they're able to trade guys and move around. Look at all the quarterbacks that have bounced around. I mean, we um, we drafted a quarterback in the third pick and, didn't really uh who was that it was Achilles Smith and and I knew and Achilles a hell of an athlete from uh Oregon but he got thrown into the he got thrown in the fire too soon mm. and so they put too much on him too quick and the the teams that do really well are the ones that draft a quarterback and let him wait you know they're get not, some apprenticeship not. and they're not they don't throw him in right away for every CJ Stroud you know that that was a rookie that did a great job with Houston, you're going to have four or five others that struggle mm-hmm. because it, the game's fast. Mm-hmm. We tell our kids all the time, when you go every level you go up, the, the speed of the game gets faster. Oh, yeah. Same in, same in soccer. Yeah, yeah. And the crazy part of it is we called one of our offensive linemen that's at Ohio, and he goes, Coach, you were right. You know, and never uh, – the game's a lot faster than what – I didn't believe you. Oh, you you know how much faster it is, and so now, just imagine 
how much it changes for those guys when they go into the when they go in the NFL. That's why you got to gradually, you know, progress. And you got to take care of your body too. Those NFL guys do a great job of taking care of their body. I mean, the beatings that they take, but they're on pretty strict diets, exercise routines. They're always in, you know, ice baths. I yeah, mean, yeah. it's you've got to when you're making that kind of money, you've got to take care of uh, your body. And you've seen it on some of the Netflix. They have the quarterback, and then they have receiver this year, and they they go behind the scenes and. And you could see it on Hard Knocks or some of those. Yeah, I like the, I like the. It's uh, very much like it's very very much like you see on Hard Knocks. That's the that's the lifestyle. And and uh, you know I always, I learned one thing when I first went in there. If it, they said as a coach, if you can help the player get better, they'll listen to you. If not, they're not going to listen to you. I mean, they have three or four more zeros on their paycheck than you do. I mean, you get paid well in the, in the NFL, but the players, yeah, you know, and it, and so you've got to be able to understand they're not like the college kids of those days. Now, shoot, some of these college kids make as much money in college football as they do in the NFL. Yeah. Somebody said Caleb Williams might have taken a pay cut from USC <laughs> to, the, <laughs> to the first pick of the draft with That's the Bears. Funny. So. Everything, my time in the NFL, everything's changed now because yeah. of the money and the other things that are going, and the pressure, you know, that goes along with it. It's, Do, you, if you win, you sell tickets. If you sell tickets, you fill the stadium and it makes everybody happy. Yeah. Did you enjoy it? I did. I enjoyed it because I didn't have to, you didn't have to recruit. Oh, yeah. You didn't have to worry if they were going to class. <laughs> you didn't have yeah. to worry about if they had enough to eat. Yeah. And where they were going to sleep, you didn't have those those things because they all had it all. They it was it was strictly a business. So in that aspect, it was fun, but I did miss all those other things, uh, making a them. difference and taking care of them. It yeah. really you really make a difference at the college level than you do. Well, really at the community college level is the last innocent football you're going to play. Till mm-hmm. it becomes a business, because college football at the four year level is a business now. Yeah. So that's that's how much has changed. Is that why you stay at VC? You know, it's it's. Uh, I learned a long time ago that coaching isn't a job; it's a lifestyle. Yeah. And uh, I really finally, maybe five years, ten years ago, I I uh, figured God's going to put you where you're supposed to be, and I just trust that. And I've had some opportunities to leave, but. I just like that the my quality of life is so good. I already did all that other stuff, mm-hmm. and to go back to it, um, you know, I don't know that I'd go back to it in in the the rules and the things that they have to do today. Being a Division One coach today is tough. Yeah. I th- I've heard people come to me and say the two best jobs in coaching is the NFL as a position coach, or to be a full time community college coach and teacher or coach and instructor. And I've had guys come out and, uh, you know, from other colleges that are friends. I know a lot of people in, in the business from being in it. And they'll walk out, we'll walk out the field and they'll look out and they go, coach, if you ever live here, I'm going to kick your butt. You can't ever leave, leave here. He goes, if you want to trade jobs anytime, just let me know. So I think I'm blessed and, and I'm in a great spot and, uh, Coach Stanlin always tells me, who's a Ventura legend, he always tells me you died and went to heaven when you got this job. So I, I'm blessed to have a really good staff. Uh, you know, I have a great wife that's that's supportive. And, you know, it's – it's uh, my family's always been a football family, although – and they all coach with me uh, at VC. Yeah. And now they're all moved back. Uh, they're all – one's in Texas and two are in Cincinnati – but they grew, they bounced around everywhere, so it's. I did that to my parents, so I got paid back, right? Yeah. It just it's funny how it goes around. I mean, I moved away and took the grandkids away from my mom and dad, and uh, now they took them away from me. But mm-hmm. I still get back there and see them. And today, you know, you got FaceTime and you got Zoom and you got everything, so it's a little bit uh, easier to communicate and talk to them and stay connected. Stay connected. Yeah, that's that's yeah. the best way. What um, what would you say was your turning point for like some of your biggest 
uh, moments of growth as a coach? That's a that's a great great question because I took a uh, just to go back. Um, you know, as a as a young coach, you always think you know it all. And I remember getting a head high school coaching job at 25. I was nowhere near ready for that. So that I went and became a, a college assistant at 26, and I wasn't ready for that. Yeah. And then I became a community college head coach at, in, in my 30s at Fresno City College. One year I went back to college and went to University of Nevada, and then I started bouncing all over the country. And before you know it, you know, you've climbed up, you've made more money, but I don't think I ever really, I guess to use a term, I never stopped and smelled the roses because you were just always going for the next thing. And I don't think until I got to, uh, you know, I was in the NFL and I was had a chance to go coach at the Rams and then I had a chance to be the head coach at Sacramento State and I took that job and it wasn't what I thought it was. Um, I didn't do my due diligence Uh, on a lot of things. And you have to look, you really have to look inside out when you take these jobs. I I tell the young coaches that come in all the time, don't make ego decisions because you make a lot of mistakes with your ego. And I think when I went to the University of San Diego that was a uh, non-scholarship Division I FCS school, was a Catholic school, Uh, all the kids there drove nicer cars than I did. It was a beautiful campus. And I saw kids that played football for the love of the game. Hmm. And at that moment, I thought, you know, let, let God guide you where you need to go. Um, and I was just, that's when I applied for all the junior college jobs. And I think until I got to Ventura, I finally figured it out that uh, coaching ball is coaching ball. It doesn't matter. Your ego is what tells you you need to be at this place, or I need to be on TV, or I need to. I've done all that. I've been on Hard Knocks. I've, you know, been on those those shows inside the NFL or whatever it was on HBO, and seen myself. You know, you get your fifteen minutes of fame and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, it's about relationships, yeah, and it's about helping others, and it's just you don't think about that when you're so busy worrying about what's next. I just think I'm very lucky to be where I'm at and have an opportunity to change lives. And when the kids come back and and they tell me, they'll come back, I always tell them, you're going to wish Ventura was a four-year college. And they'll come back, Coach, you were right. God, I wish Ventura was a four-year school. I wish I was still here. I can't tell you how much I missed it. You know, and, and you know, every once in a while we'll tell you, you know, you, you guys were my favorite coaching staff. I loved playing here. That stuff, that's like the uh, – I always say is the the money that you get that doesn't have a currency. Hmm. You know, it's it's just it's those blessings that you get back from the kids. And then when you see them get their bachelor's degree, we have eighty seven percent of our kids that that left uh, Ventura College and went to four year have got their bachelor's degree. That's a pretty pretty awesome number. And then see them with their own kids. And then when I get old enough, some of the kids I recruited and coached. They're sending their sons to play for me, and my daughter tells me that I need to uh, stay coaching a little longer so I can coach my grandson. But huh. I don't know about that. But uh, it's—I think that's that was a long-winded answer to uh, to that question. I think it's a process, and I think it's at certain times you have to kind of fall. My old head coaches say, uh, "Falling isn't failing unless you fail to get up." And uh, you're gonna fall coaching. Oh yeah. And you're gonna make some. Uh, you're gonna make some st- mistakes. And probably the thing that was the best thing for me was being genuine and being who I am and not trying to be somebody else. Yeah. I had some great mentors, and so my early years of being a head coach, I wanted to be a little bit like Coach Sweeney at Fresno. I wanted to be like Walt Harris at Pittsburgh. I wanted to be like Frank Mazzotta at Cerritos. What What, what were they like? Just different. Coach Swinney was a hard rock miner and the toughest SOB you'd ever seen. And his hands were like both the size of both mine. He, and he was a Golden Glove boxer and and just a tough Irishman. And uh, Coach Mazzotta was just always a, he had a great way of keeping everybody happy. And then Coach Harris was very very detailed on everything 
that he did. He'd, he'd get mad at me if a guy came out with one long sock and one short sock, things like that, you know, little, little things like that. And then my dad, you know, as a, as a high school coach, I always looked up, always looked up to him too. And I learned a lot of things from him, but you know, until you do it yourself, I always tell him, don't, you know, Oh, if I was head coach, I'd do this. And I said, just wait till you're sitting in that chair. It's mm-hmm. not as easy as you think. Mm-hmm. And you have to have a little trial and error. Oh, yeah. And once you do, I think you learn it. And sometimes it didn't happen until I was probably 50 years old till I figured it out. You know, I might have been 25 years into the business before I figured it out. So taking taking the lumps. I won a lot of games, got a lot of championship rings, and been to a lot of bowl games. And, you know, you go through those the highs and lows of every season. I've got you know, great memories at every level. I mean, we can talk about so much. Uh, talk about some of your memories, some of your best memories. One of the best ones was 1992. Growing up in Southern California, I was at Fresno State, and we were like 28-point underdogs, and we came down and beat USC in the Freedom Bowl. Wow. And that was that was, uh, that was was like a pretty, pretty good – no, as, as a coach. As a coach. As okay. a coach. As a player, probably uh, – you know, when I first went to Fresno State, and they were building a new stadium, and it, we were just finishing it up, and uh, we were going to play the first game in that stadium the end of my junior year. So I would, I'd walk in and I say, you know, I'm going to coach, I'm going to score the first touchdown in this stadium. Just set it, just speak it into existence, and sure enough, I did. Wow. And I always said, that's one record they can't take away from you. They pulled the grass out and put turf in, so I don't have mm. any. Uh, there's not no no memories there, except for that corner. But were you uh, a receiver? I was a receiver. Nice. I can still remember the the play call. It was a 15 go, which was a five route, a little comeback and go, and uh, 36 yard touchdown. And November 15th of 1980. So uh, that's awesome. You know, and that and that's kind of the way your uh, your memories of the game. The greatest the greatest thing, as I always say, is it's kind of like an Oreo cookie. You know, the 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 filling is where in the middle is where all the memories are made, you know, because in the very beginning, the cookie shells, the very beginning, you're really, you're scared, you're nervous. And at the very end, you're, you're sad that it's over. It's, it's, you got to enjoy the middle. And that's, I always tell the kids, they got to play in the moment, mm. you know, and quit worrying about what's next. If you don't, it's going to pass you by. You know, people always say, I go, There's, you guys have so many opportunities and you're so busy worrying about what's next. It's right in front of you. Take advantage of it. It might change the course of how your whole career or life changes. You know, it's, it's, it's a, uh, I don't know, I don't want to get too much into the wisdom of everything. but no, I want to hear it. It's been, uh, it's been just a, a, a great ride that I'm still, you You're know, still I'm, on. I'm still on. And, and uh, I think it's very important, I, I talked about earlier, is what you put in your body and taking care of yourself. And I go to the gym you know, five days a week, and, and uh, I do everything. I lift weights, and, and, you know, I walk the dogs. I love love my dogs and take them for, for walks with my wife and, and just watch what I eat. You know, and we're going to splurge every now and then, but, uh, you know, we can have a pizza or yeah. those type of things. But uh, for the most part, if you really take care of yourself and you have a good mental, I think you got to have a, a, a sound – sound mind and body and and kids nowadays they get too depressed over things and a lot of it is their diet and what's in their food i won't get into all the nutrition stuff but uh, a lot of it is is that and they can fix that i can tell them if they watch what they're doing now they're going to make it a little bit easier when they get in their 50s and 60s -hmm. life be a little bit easier for them take us back to uh sorry to cut you off take us back to the the bowl game the upset over usc Oh, geez. Well, we had... Uh, so you were coaching then? I was coaching then. I was the wide receiver coach, and we stayed at the Anaheim Marriott for two weeks. We even had Christmas in there. Wow. Because we played uh, the 30th, I think it was the 30th of December. So we put the team down there. We were there for two weeks. We bust to my old community college Cerritos to practice. So it was like going home week for me, and I'd go to Disneyland 
as a kid, so it yeah. was right there at Disneyland, Knott's Berry Farm, the kids there. If I ask my kids right now, all my own children, and I said, what was your favorite Christmas? I say, Dad, it was in the hotel at the Marriott for really? the Freedom Bowl. That's awesome. I mean, who, who would think that? But um, that game just building up, you know, Coach Sweeney used to talk about, you know, 55,000 disappointed fans, and we're going into Anaheim, and SC had, you know, all the – the big name guys, they were they yeah. had lost to UCLA, so it knocked them out of the Rose Bowl. So they really didn't want to be playing us. And we we got there and we just we had Trent Dilfer was our quarterback at that time. Oh, Loren- yeah. Lorenzo Neal was our was one of our running backs. I mean, we had four or five we probably had more than that. We probably had six or seven guys that ended up playing in the NFL. Ron Rivers senior, whose son is now a running back for the Rams. He was our running back, and he played for the Lions. He was he was Barry Sanders' backup for the Lions oh, yeah. for all those years. <laughs> but we had good players, and they had good players: Willie McGinnis and a bunch of others, uh, Johnny Morton, Curtis Conway. They had some really good, uh, really good players. But we wanted it. It was it was David versus Goliath, and um, all week long we talked about it. And it was, uh, and I used that uh, same analogy this year when we played Fullerton, who was the number one team. And and uh, so I went in my backyard and I got uh, River Rocks, mm. and I had each one of our kids write their goal for the game on the rock, and we put it in a bucket because we were talking about slinging the stone. Mm-hmm. That was that was the thing, and, and David versus Goliath, and that was the inspiration from that game. And we ended up upsetting the number one team in the state. Uh, in the playoffs this year, but you know those things; those things are hard to replicate week after week. Yeah. You know, and Coach Sweeney was a great. They used to say he was Bear Bryant used to tell him he was a great upset coach, hmm. and he used to get mad uh, mad at that. But he could get you ready for a game where you would you'd run through a brick wall, and he had us. He had us ready. I remember walking in in the Anaheim Stadium. And looking around, just looking up because it was all empty. And I felt like uh, the movie Hoosiers when Gene Hackman mm. took him into Butler Fieldhouse there. Yeah, and, yeah. and that was the – and we were talking like that when we were going in. This is like Hoosiers. This is going to be like Hoosiers. <laughs> and, and sure enough, it was. We ended up winning 24-7. to 7. So that was a uh, – that was my first – one of my first real big moments. And to get in that game, we had to beat – a great San Diego State team that had Marshall Falk and Darnay Scott on that team, and we weren't supposed to win that one. And we just it, – it showed me the mental part of the game. Sometimes the best team doesn't win. The most athletic team doesn't necessarily win the game. The most prepared team and the team that believes they can are the ones that get it done. And that was such a li- – I've got a lifetime of lessons from playing for that man, for Coach Sweeney and – so I'm able to still use those things today, almost you know, 30 years later. So he was a great motivator. He was a great motivator. He he, he was. Uh, That's one like of I the said, hardest things about coaching is motivating the kids all the time. I don't think they make many coaches. We'll put it this way: his style might not work into with today's mm. athlete. He's he was very hard nosed. He okay. didn't have any problem. Uh, we we get together, have our alumni things, and get together, and we we mimic him and imitate some oh, of the yeah. things he said. <laughs> and we and there isn't to a T. We all sit there and say, wait, I don't think Coach Sweeney could could do it in today's because he had the we had one newspaper in town and three TV stations, so he could control all that. But yeah. with social media and everybody filming everything nowadays. Yeah. He would have been, uh, he would have been in the principal's office quite a few times, or the president's mm. office, uh, mm. probably a few times. With, uh, but that was the way he coached, and it worked for that that athlete in that day and age. It worked. It worked for me, so I'd run through the wall for that guy. Yeah. And, and if he came out of heaven now and told me to, I'd probably do it too. I probably wouldn't know any better. Yeah, it's such a skill to have. To be able to motivate like that, you know. I was blessed to have a lot of good ones, and so I would, you know, I think that I have that. Uh, I've learned a lot, and it's helped me in my coaching career. So I've used that part of it, but then you've got to put your own spin on it and be your you own be genuine yourself. self. Because yeah. kids see through that stuff. Yeah. They see through that stuff. and Plus, you can only fake 
not being yourself for so long. That's right. You know? It's going to show up. <laughs> you got to be point. yourself at some point. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. That's that is the truth. One of my uh, favorite books is Wooden. Oh, I love it. Yeah, it's just like it speaks to me all the time. It's just. I was lucky. I went to his basketball camp at Cal Lutheran when I was in wow. the, in the fifth grade, and then again in the sixth grade. And then when I was at Fresno State, our AD was Gary Cunningham, who was John Wooden's assistant oh, wow. on the sideline, and he got me a pyramid of success signed by him, and I still mm. have and still have. And uh, John Wooden, though, I was the biggest UCLA basketball fan growing up, and with Bill Walton and yeah. Lou Alcindor, which is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar yeah, yeah. now, and all those great players through the 60s and 70s and the dynasty, uh, just great memories but John Wooden was probably one of the gentlest motivators you know he's very calm and he didn't win his first uh, NCAA championship till like his 16th or 17th season yeah. so he went through some trials and tribulations too yeah. and figured out who he was and I think that's really what it is is you got to figure out who you are first and then you got to figure out you got to Pete Carroll taught me one time you got to learn your learners too you can't do, you know, you can't overcoach. People don't care how much you know. It's how much, you know, how much you care. So yeah. you can't give them too much. you got to know how much they can handle. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's a fine art. Um, coaching is really, it's a lot more to it than just putting a whistle around your neck and yelling at, at a guy. And it's not, X's and O's is such a smart, I can find a million X's and O's guys. It's finding those little fine details uh, that make the difference, and the guys that can relate. It's mm -hmm. really important. You got to relate, and you got to motivate. Mm -hmm. You know, in today's age, so it's, it's such a fun job. It is. I it's a blast. It. It's it's. That's why I said a long time ago. They said coaching isn't a job; it's a lifestyle, mm -hmm. and it really is. And that's why people have a hard time. I mean, I don't even know what it's like. I've never had to put a suit and tie on uh, to go to work. <laughs> awesome. The only time I put a suit and tie on is when I flew. We flew charter at the Bengals, and we wanted to look good, you know, coming off the plane or something. But I mean, or dressing up, going to a wedding or something. But uh, for the most part, you know, your shorts and a hoodie and tennis shoes for a lot of the a lot yeah. of the days out of the year, and get to be outside in the sunshine. And uh, yeah. I uh, I started coaching. I got offered by my high school coach to come coach uh, at the high school after I graduated college, and I did that for a couple of years. And then I thought to myself, "Oh, I should get a I should go get a real job." And so I did for a number of years. And I'm like, "Oh, this isn't this isn't for me." So I got back into coaching. That's awesome. That that's that, I hear that story so often in. You know, I always feel bad for the guys. Uh, I think I'm going to go do this. And then what are you going to do? You, you're never going to get the, the fulfillness that you do in coaching because it's a 24-7 job. My wife always tells me, you know, I said, I'm you're home, but you're working 24-7. I'm looking on, you know, X or Instagram or something. I'm getting a DM message here, a text message here, an email here. and. Yeah. I now leave my phone downstairs when I go to bed. I leave it down. I charge it all night. I get up. I have my, because I do the intermittent fasting. So I have my two cups of coffee mm -hmm. and I read all my emails, all my text messages, and all my, you know, DMs. I do that in the morning and have a routine. Then I go to the gym. So yeah. it's just like you develop a, a routine that works for you, you know, and you, and you stay. Stay with it that way. And the minute I get home from the gym, the dogs are at the door wanting to go for a walk. So it's been, it's, it's just, it's a great, it's a great lifestyle. And then I get ready and drive into work. Yeah. Get, get on one-on-one -on -one and head north. Head north. Yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of do the same thing. I have, uh, I don't usually text or call people uh, if they text me or call me after 9 o'clock. That's good. Yeah, That's just... really good. That's about when I am. It's usually between 9 or 10 I put that phone away. And I always keep my, my uh, ringer on silent, too. Oh, yeah. So I miss a lot of, <laughs> I miss a lot of calls. But my, my, my phone's been on silent for like five years. Yeah, it's I'm with never, you. It's I'm with never, never ringing. Yeah, I think I only did it when my wife told me I had to take a call if she calls, so I have to turn the ringer on. But other than that. I'm surprised how many calls I like, see 
you know, when it's on silent. I, I still feel like I, I get all my calls, even though it's on silent. Well, with this new Apple Watch, it oh. buzzes now. You know, I like, do that. Yeah, but uh, that's only if I'm that the phone's nearby. If it's not nearby, if I'm out in the field, in 42 years of coaching, I've never taken my cell phone to the field. Really? Now the guys joke and they go, "Coach, half the time you were coaching, they didn't even have cell phones." I said, mm. "Yeah, you're right. I had those big. <laughs> we had those big brick phones uh, when I first started coaching. We used to go." And I'd fly into LAX recruiting, and I'd go to National Rent a Car, and then they'd ask me if you wanted a, a phone. It was actually in a in a case with a battery, you know, and you'd put it in the seat next to you, and you'd have a have a phone. But most of the time, recruiting, I remember driving and going over the grapevine, coming from Fresno, going into LA, and stopping and getting on a payphone and calling a guy. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the grapevine. I'll see you in about an hour and a half. I'll be at a home visit. Yeah, and it just. Didn't, and I had the Thomas guides to tell me where to go, you know, the maps. You'd go by each county at Costco. Or, That's, that sounds like some pretty wild days. It was. You'd, you'd map <laughs> you, in, in the evening, you'd get back to your hotel, and you'd map out the schools, and you'd kind of know what roads. And I was always big to find the little shortcuts and the back roads if I could avoid the freeways because you know how L.A. freeways are at after 3 o'clock. Yeah. So I'd I'd learned different routes to go and tried to you know incorporate that and then you got to get back to the hotel and do it all over again and yeah. it was uh, it was fun I mean even when I was in Pittsburgh I had the California Community Colleges I flew out here and and then when I was uh, doing prepping for the draft in the NFL I always my favorite stops were Arizona and Arizona State I loved going in there because it was spring training mm. and I could go do the workouts and I loved SC and UCLA and I'd always want to stay an extra day try to stay at Manhattan Beach or somewhere like that right in between and yeah. you know just uh, when it's on their dime you can you know you can splurge <laughs> a little bit but it was uh, it was always fun uh, doing that coming even when I lived away coming back to California I always missed it I always couldn't wait to have an opportunity to come back. Yeah. It's it's special. You know, you did it, did the same thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I do love the Midwest, though. There's something about, like, the woods of the Midwest. Oh, I love it, too. I would, uh, I ran track in high school, and um, all winter we did, like, winter conditioning, and we'd just go run for hours and hours and get lost in the woods. It is, it is and special. I, I know what... But, the funny thing about the woods, I was in Pittsburgh and, uh, and even in Cincinnati, and I went by a high school in the spring. No, in the winter. I went in December, and the trees are all yeah. open. So the school was there, and I'd go back in the spring, and I couldn't find the school. <laughs> I said, the, I know the road's here somewhere, but you couldn't see it anymore because the trees. And that's the one thing about it. It's so green yeah. back there, and there's trees everywhere. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, and there's the hills and rivers and, you know, you get your four seasons and learn how to sh uh, shovel snow and yeah. put salt on the road. And, and it feels so much like, like Tom Sawyer or Huck Finn. Yeah. Like I just want to get on a, ra a raft and float down the river and not worry about anything, you know? <laughs> it is a slower, uh, it is a slower lifestyle. And to get on, you don't get on, you know, you have the same freeways or those type yeah. of things. Everybody knows the roads and, yeah. the, you know, the the back roads to everything. And things pop out of nowhere. I mean, I don't know. Until GPS came and they alert you to make a right turn, sometimes you'd drive past things. You didn't know there's a park somewhere back in there and you couldn't find it. But there was – I don't regret any of the seven years I was in the Midwest. I, I truthfully enjoyed it. Um, Pittsburgh and Cincinnati were, those were good, good memories. My kids love it. You know, yeah. they like, they like Ohio. Did they, so they grew up sometimes, some, some of them. They were born in, they were born in Fresno and then they, and then we moved to Pittsburgh. So they went to middle school and elementary school in both Fresno and Pittsburgh and then we went to Cincinnati, and my oldest daughter finished high school there and then went to University of Cincinnati. So she had a lot of girlfriends she graduated with. My son went halfway through um, high school and then went back to Fresno. Uh, we moved back to California, and he finished in Fresno. And then my youngest daughter finished her four years in Fresno. 
But then she went to the Naval Academy, and then she came back and went to Ohio State. Wow. And then finished at Cal Lutheran. She was <laughs> a uh, she was a swim uh, diver okay. so on the swim swim and diving, and did really well. And and my son played wide receiver for me at Sac State. And then my son in law, who played linebacker for for me, ended up marrying my daughter. You're not supposed to let your players marry your kids, but wow. that that happened. So they and they all coached. We were all here in Ventura, and then. You know, I, as much as I miss them, I think their quality of life is really good, and the kids are thriving, and I think it's – I'm glad to see them all doing well. Mm-hmm. My youngest daughter was in Carlsbad and then got transferred. She's a, uh, done really well with Enterprise Rent-A-Car and has two grandkids and, and uh, my two grandkids, and they're, they're awesome. So I get to go see them. I can go to – I can fly to – Austin and she lives in the outskirts there and then I can get on a plane and fly to Cincinnati and see them all and yeah. back to California back to California I like flying out of Burbank though it's much easier oh yeah LAX is such a pain yeah I've 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 always had a decent experience at LAX for some reason I always just like I love to see like LAX in movies it is you it, know it's just yeah. like oh i know that place i was there so often as a kid and then you know in college and everything flying in and out of there that now it's i get lost in there mm. it's crazy the way it used to be i remember it it was so easy mm. but now it's uh, i only really grew up a little not that far i could take the artesia boulevard all the way in or the 91 freeway till it ended before the 105 or any of those things were built so it was uh you got a lot of southern, a lot of southern California memories. Do you have like uh, mentors for your for coaching for that have taught you some valuable lessons along the way? I do uh, along the way. Obviously, you know, my dad was my first mentor as as a coach, and and growing up on the sidelines, and you know, my brother uh, is is two and a half years younger than me. So, what would happen is my dad would go to his summer practices or his football practices. And we weren't in school yet, so the oldest kid went with dad, and the youngest kid stayed home with mom to kind of break it up. And so I just went to the uh, went to all his practices and watched him coach. And you know, it, the funny thing was is he always would tell me because they had these uh, Coke machines back then. They were just filled with ice. They weren't ones that you put money in. They were, and and if I was good, I got a Coke. You know, mm. so I. But I loved it, and I just. Remember the smells, and, and uh, I think that's probably my first. I couldn't imagine wanting to do anything else. If I, I'd want to play as long as I could play, and then I wanted to be a coach. Did I you always play any? I think I always did. And as I got older, and even when I was playing in, at community college at Cerritos for Frank Mazzotta, he used to always tell me, You're going to be a coach someday. And then, uh, and then I went to Fresno State and Jim and played for Jim Sweeney, and he'd tell me all the time, you're going to be a coach someday. And I'd say, no, I want to keep playing. And <laughs> I had a chance to go play in the USFL, and uh, when I got cut from that and came home, I, sure enough, that's what I did. I went into coaching, and, uh, you know, I always – Did you think of coaching as a career at that point? I did. Like I, as a concept, like – I could actually make a living as a coach. I, I did. I didn't really want to be – the funny thing was I didn't really want to be a high school coach for some reason. My dad was – and I don't know if it was just me being competitive. I kind of wanted to go one step above, mm-hmm. even though I started um, in high school for a couple of years and then went to the four-year, and you know, back and forth and four-year community college, four-year NFL – four year community colleges it's kind of been a, a roller coaster ride. I always envisioned myself loving but I didn't just love the X's and O's part of it. I loved all the other stuff that went involved with it. I really loved recruiting. Hmm. I loved uh, you know the analytical things of the game and when I was a young coach and I was twenty five and, and coaching at, at Fresno State in my first job, I volunteered for everything you know I was the I was the the liaison to the equipment man it's where I learned all about jersey numbers and gear and 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 understood the Nike uh give uh the Nike 
package that we got. Mm -hmm. So Coach Sweeney put me in charge of that, and he goes, hey, you get an extra $500 of Nike gift certificate for doing it. Awesome. It's like, I got $1,000 worth of Nike gear, you know, and they'd bring the catalogs home, and everybody would want to order through it. (laughs) So I love that part of it. Then I learned about financial aids. I learned about admissions. I really got into the rules and I know it's going to sound crazy, but I got into learning the loopholes to those rules mm. and creating ways to get kids recruited by understanding the rules. Mm. And there was ways around a lot of things, you know, when we had what was called Prop 48, which uh, came into effect. So I were able to get a lot of those players that beat USC uh, because we, we got them there on Prop 48. But uh, Interesting. just in the financial aid part of how that worked, and so that's helped me uh, all the way into it. There's a lot of guys that I think in coaching that, you know, get caught. Like Walt Harris was at Pittsburgh was an unbelievable uh, X's and O's guy. He was as detailed on things with offense and, you know, from the Bill Walsh uh, West Coast offense. I mean, I learned more – I always said I got my master's degree in football from Walt Harris, and then when I went to the NFL with uh, and worked for uh, Bruce Coslett and Dick LeBeau, Dick LeBeau's in the Hall of Fame, one of the greatest men I've ever met, that was my doctorate degree in football. I mm-hmm. mean, because that's all you did. And it was really uh, interesting. So I've got a little bit from each one of those guys that I'd worked for and coached with, and, and then... Uh, this is going to sound crazy, but I've actually got a lot of I've got a lot of things from players I've coached, mm. and I'm still like ideas about j- what? just uh, how to handle certain situations. My first recruit was Ron Jenkins. I still talked to him. We're still really good, close friends, and he's coaching at L.A. Southwest College. Terry Murphy, who was a Culver City PD that I recruited, right? You grew up right outside of. Uh, USC and went to West LA College and went to Pittsburgh. I just talked to him yesterday about football and he sent me, you know, those guys send me kids year in and year out. And there's so many of them. And, you know, you see what they do and they go on in their careers and then you call them for advice. I'm not afraid to ask a younger generation uh, for advice. And I think, well, I guess it's when I've learned to deflate the ego and think that you know it all, and go back and ask those guys that because they've taken different paths, and they a lot of those guys grew up in South Central Los Angeles and had brothers killed in in drug deals and gang violence, and and uh, I remember when Boys in the Hood came out in mm. the movie, and and I felt like I'd go into those areas and recruit, and I wasn't someone like that looked like me wasn't supposed to do that, and uh, I never felt like that. Uh, and I always wanted to, I always felt like going in there, I could get, I could make a difference in someone's life and get them out of there and get them in a better place. And those people I'm still closest with to this day. And it's just, uh, it's why I said I've got the, the older, the mentors, and then you also get it from the players you coached. And I also listened to my kids. My kids were, you know, even though they were coaching with me, they, they, gave me the they could give me the heartbeat of what was going on in the locker room because mm-hmm. they were a little younger so they'd hear things and they understood the way today's kids think and i probably said some things and did some things that that uh, might have been a little harsh in my trying to be jim sweeney through the years and and took some lumps for doing those things um I think I'm pretty much still the same guy, though. Deep down inside, I'm the same person when I was coaching at 25 as I am now, you know, almost 40 years later. Um, and I think the, the thing is just consistency. And I still goes back to relationships. And I think the relationships that you make with the coaches that you work for or worked, worked for and worked with, I had a lot of great coaches that I worked with, mm. guys that, you know, I think I had – 12 to 15 guys that I had worked with that were NFL coaches. Some of them are uh, head coaches right now in in college football. And um, my first hire at Sacramento State is now the interim head coach at Fresno State, Tim Skipper, and I still talk to him. And I uh, coached his brother and then coached with his brother. And his dad 
was was uh, kind of a mentor for me too, Jim Skipper. So it's just funny, you know, it's a very, it's six degrees of separation with coaching. And if you allow yourself to be open enough, you're going to get just as much from your players as you are from, from the coaches. And I think that's really something I might be a little bit different than others. I got, I got told a lot of times, you're getting too close to those kids. They're not, you know. I say, why? Because I have them over the house for dinner. You know, or, you know, we used to do that in the NFL. I had the receivers over for dinner, and that was, like, never heard of. Really? Because you do it in college, but they didn't – they weren't doing it oh, at the as NFL. much. Because they said, those kids are not your friends. They could be your enemies. They're the reason you could get fired. So you had a lot of bitter coaches that sat in their old ways. And, you know, they were right about some of it, but they were wrong about some of it too. I think it was all how you how you dealt with with them, and if they trust, it's tr- it comes back to trust. Yeah, it comes back to trust, and and uh, so you asked me the mentors. You know, I had the the f- four or five guys that really helped me along the way, but I have four or five. I bet you I have more than that. I bet you I have fifteen former players that have helped me too. Interesting along the way. And I loved, you know, the people that I worked for uh, at Ventura. Robin Colote, who was the president that hired me, was, you know, she's great. She still checks in with me. And, and I talked to Ned Mercedic a lot, who's the all-time winningest coach, the women's basketball coach. Hoffy, I mean, the legend. There's so much, uh, so much you can learn. And I think you can learn from other sports, too. Nelson Emery just won the state title in tennis. And I love just seeing how he does. And a lot of it's just me watching them, how they coach. You can learn a lot uh, just watching how they coach. That's why I love those coaches' shows and the inside the NFL and the hard yeah. knocks and that stuff because you just see – you know, I watch Dan Campbell with the Lions and just how he talks to the team and how he gets guys inspired to play and how did you take a team like the Lions and turn them into a playoff team. Yeah. That stuff intrigues me. Have you met Dan? Or no, anyone? no. But one of my really close friends is on his staff, yeah. and then one of our coaches on our staff is a huge from Detroit. I have two coaches from Detroit, but he's the biggest Lions fan I think I've ever seen. So he even went to the draft when it was in Detroit. So Mike Hayden, who works, who's our assistant registrar in admissions there. So it's uh, you know you learn different things from different people. From anywhere. Yeah, yeah, if you're if you open your mind up. And you got to open your heart up too, and you and you just have to kind of. I know I've given you some long-winded answers on the things, but it's kind of just it kind of comes to me, and it's like a metamorphosis of all the things through the years that uh, you think back of. Sometimes there's some players that have really. You know, I I get teary-eyed when I think about some of those those moments. It's it's yeah. uh, it's emotional. I still cry at movies. I. I <laughs> I cry at Rudy when he gets carried off. I cried in Field of Dreams when he played catch with his dad. I mean, all those uh, for miracle. the love of the uh, yeah, miracle oh. when he's spe- given the speech in the locker room, Kurt Russell. And, the, you know, the, you can go on and on uh, for the love of the game when Kevin Costner threw that no hitter and the girl he loved wasn't there and, and he sent her away and he was lonely. He didn't. There's a lot of times in coaching where you celebrate by yourself Hmm. because you're so busy getting ready for the next game that you don't really enjoy. Like, I enjoyed the Fullerton game this year when we beat them because as a team, we all went to Buca de Pepe for a a team meal on the bus on the way back. I just, you know, was like, okay, this is just awesome to be able to see the guys sitting there and eating and and breaking bread with them and then get on the bus and you get back okay now i gotta get ready to see when's the riverside mount sag game to see your next game is Mm. it's not until the season's over and you can kind of reflect back and it and i know when my career ends i'm going to reflect back and wished i don't i won't ever have regrets because that's just the way it is as a coach you just you're always on to the next thing my wife always asks me, she goes, how do you not get emotional? And I said, well, I'm used to 100 new guys every year. And she goes, you don't get emotional like when your kids move away or you're flying back there and then you're leaving them and coming back. I go, no, I'm just used to it. 
because every year I get new kids. And so you say goodbye to the ones and they go off to their four year and then you're on to the new ones and you just, it just keeps recycling. And so as long as I can do it and do it successfully and feel like I, I, you know, have some value, I'm going to do it as long as I can do it until they tell me I can't. Well, it sounds like you bring a lot of value to these boys in Ventura College. Well, that that's the that's the end goal to it too is is that, and they bring a lot of value to me. Yeah, they give me just as much as I give them. I know that sounds like a cliche, but oh, it's, man. it's from the heart. All the coaches know that. All the coaches yeah. feel that at certain times. Yeah, it's important. So. That's a long answer to a short question. Wow. No, that was, that was beautiful. That was beautiful. Um, I mean, I kind of just want to end it there. I have one more sort of kind of silly question. Like, uh, you have any favorite teams? That well, you I'm watch, still, I am players? still, I am still loyal to the uh, Cincinnati Bengals because okay. they gave me my, my shot. And, uh, and then my kids live there, and I still know some people in the front office. I know the owner who took care of the owner. I just remember Mike Brown, he was always talked about being, he was a penny pincher and all that. I remember back in the day, he gave us, every coach, a $5,000 Christmas bonus every year on our check. That's nice. And I've never had that in all my years of coaching. That's, that's, that was something I never forget. And I remember we had one of our coaches whose house was destroyed and we had a tornado my first year, went through. And it took his house, and he wrote him a check for sixty thousand dollars just so he could get clothes and supplies and hotel and everything. So, you know, with with that, uh, I think those are you know, Cincinnati. Cincinnati was 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 fun that way. But I love there's, I love driving through and seeing the arch, like as you're coming in. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's interesting. All those uh, Midwest towns, those river towns, are. Uh, and you see those stadiums when you come in. And when you go through a bridge in Pittsburgh, you're out in the country, and you go through this bridge, you come out, and then you see this town, you know, where the three rivers meet right there. It's like, where did this come from? Mm. You know, and it's like that in a lot of it, as you, as you know. But I don't know. All that stuff is uh, – It's there's just so many bits and pieces to so many things. We could – and I, I have a tendency to digress and go on and, and no. branch off. I'm like a tree no. when it comes to – when you ask me a question, I'll my wife you. used to tell me, you'd, somebody asks you what time it is, and you tell them how to build a watch. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I'll tell you what. You can come back for part two, and we can keep Love going. it. Anytime. But, I'd love, but, love to uh, hopefully get some more memories and uh, keep adding to them. For sure. Keep adding to them. Well, thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Patrick, for having me.